what we do very quickly is we discovered new ways to use technology to measure peace, especially what's called positive peace, which is not, uh, not about reducing bad behavior between people, but about increasing good behavior between people. Turns out that Tons of companies have tons of, of this kind of data, exactly. Uh, uh, they're generating it all the time. And we're looking at specifically uh, how to use that data to do good in the world and at the same time uh, change global financial market signals. The result of that is that we're dealing with exactly all the issues that we've been discussing here today at the intersection of maximizing social good for uh, of technology and of personal data, and at the same time, avoiding the as much as possible the, the potential downsides, the, the uh, potential uh, disasters, and all of those fraught issues that are uh, 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 being addressed by everybody in the room today. For those of you who saw the uh, the Knox's uh, uh, talk was such a such a great cue up for this because the kind of issues we're addressing for using sometimes very sensitive personal information in ways that uh, can be massively good, not only for individuals, but for society as a whole, are, ex are exactly these kinds of issues. So um, to give a little bit of context here, I'm going to queue up a video uh, of a startup that we're spinning out of our lab. It's a two minute explainer video. Uh, the CEO of the company is uh, Els uh, Cousamont over here. Uh, we're spinning this out. Uh, in collaboration with Energy, who I guess, in for full disclosure, I should say, is also a shareholder in Intertrust. Um, and uh, it will give you a sense of the kind of issues we're dealing with, and then we'll discuss how these uh, issues are being dealt with by a startup. And my colleagues will also touch on how it applies to existing big companies, uh, regulators, and so forth. And we'll go from there, and uh, we'll wrap up with some general discussion. All right, why don't we queue up that video? Did you realize that your business is not only good for business, it also generates amazing value for society through positive interactions. Research shows that when people have positive interactions, the level of trust goes up, people feel safer and happier, and that is worth a lot. Up to now, this value was impossible to measure, but with Pax Exchange, you get the recognition you deserve. Okay, that is a great story, but how does it work in real life? Welcome to Cityville, a city just like yours. The population of Cityville has increased because of new migrant workers. There is little interaction between the original and the new city villers, and tension between the groups has built up. Trust in Cityville is low. The mayor doesn't know how to solve this problem. His best bet is to spend millions on a police force without being able to measure the result. Meet Ayana. She is one of the new migrants. She works as a driver for a popular ride-sharing service. Today, one of her customers is Thomas. It took 22 minutes to drive Thomas to the airport while having a good conversation. Interactions like these increase the trust between Thomas and Ayana and the groups they represent. For the first time in history, data about interactions between people is captured and measured. The Pax Exchange platform uses the anonymized and aggregated information about Ayana's ride and many other interactions from other platforms to help three different groups of people, tech companies, city officials, and social entrepreneurs. For tech companies, Pax Exchange makes their positive impact visible and they can bank on that. Pax Exchange helps cities to pinpoint any problem area and to come up with solutions. On the PAX Exchange platform, they can place their challenge and attach a reward so that social entrepreneurs can come up with creative and measurable solutions for a fraction of the cost. PAX Exchange, making communities thrive. PAX Exchange is an initiative by the Peace Innovation Lab at Stanford and the Energy Innovation Hub. Join us and be the first to use and benefit from PAX Exchange. We are now open to partner. We offer a limited opportunity to a select group of leading tech companies who want insight in and get rewarded for their positive impact and forward thinking city officials who are open to explore new ways of identifying and solving their challenges. Sounds like you get in touch. 
So there you have one quick overview of how to try and capture the good that comes from this kind of sensitive, personally identifiable data, those, um, those uh, digital identities that uh, uh, Carson was talking about earlier, and um, uh, at the same time, avoid the dangers and the downside. Carla, you've been thinking a lot about exactly these kinds of issues at your company. Do you want to kick us off? Sure. Thanks, Mark. I'm Carla Holtz. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Parable. We are a privacy-friendly identification platform. So what that means is that we developed a way to anonymously identify a device without a user logging in. So unlike the walled gardens, Facebook, Google, Uber, we know a user anonymously. Um, it's pretty important in the world of personalization and especially where things are kind of going internationally with the European Union and GDPR um, to have a privacy-friendly way to identify users. Do you want me to go into a little bit more on? So I think GDPR is pretty interesting. I don't know if we're, we've talked a lot about it today, but um, obviously one of the biggest things that GDPR will require is opt-in, and this is all go due to go into effect May 25th, 2018. A lot of big companies out there are not even planning for this and really risk it being slapped with tens of million dollar fines for not having an opt-in mechanism. Um, and basically what opt-in is, well, GDPR makes, differentiates between data processors and data controllers. And data processors is anybody, any company that just processes data. A data controller is the one that's required to have the opt-in mechanism. And a data controller, once any c company drops a cookie on a user, they become a data controller. So every last given website, every last company that may not be in the position to necessarily become a data controller is now going to be forced to s put, put opt-in in place, and if not, potentially risk, what is it, 4% of all revenues for each user, you know, getting fagged with that. So. Um, there's really some new interesting business opportunities around GDPR and creating a third-party entity to, you know, monitor opt-in for, you know, the entire ecosystem. And GDPR basically uh, takes us to currently the highest and I should say in some, in some respects the most difficult standard to achieve. And so it's the standard probably everybody has to aim for. Um, Thomas, you've been thinking a lot about um, how this applies for uh, business customers. Um, yeah, thank you, Mark. So my name is Thomas Sander. I'm a director for data privacy at Innertrust Technologies. So um, one of the things when I saw your app, one of the ideas is it needs to be designed with a lot of privacy in mind in order to put, in order for it, for example, to be compliant with GDPR, um, this type of technology. So we yeah. have privacy by design right behind you. Why don't you give an overview of that? Okay, yes. So privacy by design is a concept that has been around for a long time in the technology community, and it means that you build privacy into any product or into any technology or even business processes that you're creating from the start. So you're, and it means that in the beginning, I would say, it's, although it's not exactly clear how, the, how you should do it, um, there are some ideas that I think make a lot of sense in order to pursue a privacy by design strategy, and this is also required by the GDPR, so you have to do it. If you would build something like this in Europe, you have to apply some privacy design strategy to it. So how would one do it? So in this case, I would suggest you initially you map out all the data flows, which data are being collected, where are they um, flowing within the system, who is going to get them. Then you look at these and you do a risk analysis. What are the risks that are associated with these different data flows? Then in a third step, you would look for mitigations. And the mitigations could be procedural, but in particular for privacy by design also technical, which means you will use a whole toolbox of technologies for so pseudonymization, encryption, um, data minimization, um, uh, data aggregation, and lots of other techniques in order to build privacy technology into what you're doing. And then the fourth thing, the GDPR is very much about um, accountability, which means you don't just should do the right thing, you should also be able to prove that you do the right thing, so you should document the whole process, what you've done. And that's also what I would do for this uh, fascinating and exciting app that you've been working on. So, quick question there. Uh, um, 
so many, so much of this data is coming from existing established companies. Um, we collaborated, Facebook was our very first partner back in 2009 to prove that we could measure peace this way. Uh, I think you can still go to, actually I'll ask somebody in the audience to please go to facebook.com slash peace and just raise your hand and tell us how many Israelis and Palestinians fronted each other in the last 24 hours. It's uh, usually a surprising number. Um, the, so these are existing large companies, some of them probably the kind of companies that Carla already has as customers. Um, to what extent does their compliance with GDPR, to what extent does that pass through or, or any of their other uh, uh, um, things that they're doing to address these issues? So I, I would think this is a very fascinating application because the data that you're processing are, for example, data about your racial and ethnic group, about your religion, all these different things. They're even categorized in the GDPI sensitive data. So they're extra strong requirements Absolutely. for them. Yeah. One of them is, for example, that if you process them, you should have an opt-in normally. So you need to make sure that you have the opt-in collected. Maybe Carlos' company can help you or someone else to do that in a way that meets the high quality standards for consent that the GDPI is setting. So these would be one of the things that I would worry about You know, if I wanted to do it in, in compliance with GDPR. Um, and you, know, you need to notify consumers about what you're doing. And, um, and then they need to give an informed and active consent. So in a pretext, a pre-checked box would not qualify. And then I think you should apply whatever you can because the privacy and security measures need to be proportional to the risk. So in this case, because you're having sensitive data, the risk is high, no question. So you should pull out all the stops and put in what you can in terms of data minimization, how the data are flowing. Perhaps you should try to de-identify the data as much as possible, aggregate data as soon as possible in order to make them uh, to, to order to remove the, so that they're no longer as sensitive. So those are the type of strategies that I would use for this, for this application. Thank you, Thomas. Albi, you've been thinking about the persistence of security across platforms. I hope this gives you a, a case to think about where, for example, Uber data flows through and into an app like this and then back out again. How do you deal with um, those persistence issues and the governance issues related to it? So uh, let, me, let me first say something about GDPR just because I... Uh, I we're always, the world is full of unintended consequences. And I could imagine that if I were a Google or a Facebook, I might look at GDPR and say, well, what I will do is I will separate my European assets. They will uh, abide by GDPR. I won't co-mingle them with my US assets. I will treat America as America. I will keep lobbying the US government as hard as I do to make sure that I have a lot more freedom and flexibility. And that we could potentially, I'm not suggesting this, but I one of the things I like to do is be provocative. We could look back in 10 years and say that the United States continued to be an innovation leader and that Europe, because of deep learning and big data and AI and not having access to this kind of detailed data, ended up falling behind in their ability to compete in the AI space. I'm not saying this is certainly not something that I want, but it, it does strike me as uh, one possible universe. Um, <clears throat> A, I don't really want to talk about this, so I, I, I like the idea of, um, I find when I go to IoT conferences that the idea of security of most of the companies is you secure it on their servers and you secure it in transit and then once you download it to somebody else, it's sort of out of their hands. And I think Knox addressed this a lot and so I, I won't go into it, but I think it's important to maintain uh, governance over the data as it is distributed and as it gets to its various places. But I think the most interesting thing was there was someone sitting here who left who said, um, uh, what exactly did he say? He says, um, who decides? So as we think about um, artificial intelligence systems and how software is doing things, there are the classic sort of easy examples like uh, how does a self-driving car determine whether to kill the 60-year-old man or the nanny, um, and it'll be doing that very quickly. And maybe there are mechanisms for that. There are triage procedures that they use in, in hospitals, uh, you know, out um, in, in poor areas where they don't have enough facilities, and they say, okay, well, we can only keep these six people alive out of 30, and there's a process for determining whose life is the most valuable. But there are all sorts of AI decisions being made um, 
that we are not necessarily privy to. So Facebook's news algorithm is an AI decision. Um, it's pretty easy if you are building an AI system and you say, well, I will divide my customers into half. Half of them I'll do what I thought was good. The other half I will let the AI try to optimize on CPMs. And lo and behold, the API did a better job and so we get more advertising revenue. It's pretty easy on that metric to decide, okay, we'll go with the one that's more advertising revenue. It's more difficult when you have to make decisions based upon what the news feed looks like or all sorts of social behavior. There's lots of, um, an AI could easily decide that the rates for insurance would be different in different parts of the world or in different uh, red line areas based upon their history. And AI decisions are based on the data it collects. And so if it is collecting data from a group of people who have unconscious prejudices, then the AI will be operating in ways that are prejudiced. And so for me, I think one of the most interesting discussions is around how you put forensic data or forensic hooks into the AI data so you can determine how it made the decisions and also how you can oversee the process of making those decisions and inputting the data in the first place to determine whether or not it is objective or maybe there is no real objectives because certainly people of different religions have different opinions about an objective truth but it maybe represents an agreed upon uh, approach for governance and for me the all the talk today around governance, the most interesting question of governance is how does governance map against systems that are intelligent enough to decide things without our actively controlling them? Part of the power shift that's going on there, and you can hand that mic to Zaki because he'll need it next. Um, part of the power shift is we're seeing a massive move away from, from active power in legislatures uh, and people writing legal code uh, towards uh, entrepreneurs and business people and people writing social code instead. Um, you aspire to be one of those people, Zaki. And um, in the long run, your generation will decide this and you decide it largely by the user experience of something like this. Um, what are your thoughts on how to capture maximum user um, outcomes, positive outcomes in this kind of context, um, avoid the downside and avoid the squick factor for the users as well? I think speaking as a millennial, uh, I think there should be a real attention to sort of stratification of data based on age and the way that different age groups use technology. Um, I'm not sure if you've met any Uber drivers who have you know, driven to high schools and picked up students, driven to elementaries and picked up students and took them for a ride on the town. Um, but there are children who basically have the power to do things that were unimaginable 10, even five years ago. And sort of getting that data is something that is extremely relevant to both questions of GDPR and the way that the future of technology use will happen in the next 10 years. Um, and I think that's what's really interesting about uh, the PACS exchange and the sort of way of uh, understanding social issues through data. Um, and I think in specifically response to GDPR's increased standards, especially around the questions of age, around questions of race and gender, uh, there's a lot to talk about um, when it comes to like how do we decide you know, maybe like a social program for children, who gets access to what data, and the sort of uh, unintended uh, consequences of, you know, seeing data as just um, a bunch of numbers as opposed to sort of a very personal um, connection or understanding um, of what that person is. And I think that that's sort of maybe a starting point that a lot of social programs need to sort of think about uh, moving forward. Thank you, Zaki. There's one of, the, one of the issues we've all seen, and it came up several times in, in the comments of the audience for the, for the previous panels, um, the, the issue of uh, um, fake news, the issue of AI uh, algorithmic bias, um, and um, uh, re related issues of um, uh, governance around that. There, there tend to be sort of first order effects and second order effects of all of these transformative technologies. Um, the first order effects we try and control, the second order effects tend to be a little bit out of our hands. One of the examples around fake news is that um, we invented here in the Valley democratized distributed business models. Things like Google AdWords, things like uh, um, all of the uh, Facebook um, um, ad models and so on. Carla, you've been um, dealing directly with some of these. 
Um, some of these have uh, had accidental unintended consequences in terms of uh, only in the last year have we become uh, aware that um, uh, these kinds of business models can be captured and used against us. Um, I, I'm, you can have a shot at this if you want it, and you can avoid it if you want it. Um, I'd be curious to know what all of you are thinking about how to address those kinds of, uh, when we detect that there is an unintended consequence that we hadn't foreseen, how do we address it there? Because there certainly will be, um, around any of these personal data issues, there certainly will be also with the implementation of GDPR, uh, there will be unintended consequences that will only be visible five or 10 years out. How do we address them when we see them? I think personally, the GDPR is a step in the right direction. Um, especially when dealing with uh, the sort of uh, immense risk that we're in right now. The only way forward is to first do regulation and then understand uh, the sort of consequences, um, you know, based on the regulation and then take steps either to increase regulation, to reform regulation, or to curtail parts of it. Um, I, don't, I think that the wrong move is to just sort of go forward and sort of hope that innovation will fix itself. So. It I get the sense that privacy is becoming um, almost binary. So in the United States, in, in much of the Western world, uh, uh, or the, the world as we know it, <clears throat> you, uh, we've all made this compromise for our privacy. I'm very happy that if I ask my phone where the nearest ice cream store is, that it knows me, it knows where I am, that it's able to make intelligent decisions, that I can do all this. This is a great luxury in a world where we are for the most part free and we are not very concerned about being tracked. I'm not yet, uh, at least Trump is not yet tracking my every movement and I, I feel that Google or Facebook knowing what I'm doing is, you know, like a great butler that can help me. Um, in other territories, um, they would give anything for privacy, and it's a, it's a, it's a rare, rare commodity. Um, I read, I think it was in the New York Times Magazine a few weeks ago, an article where they talked about a woman crossing the street in a city in China. I don't know if it, did anybody see that article? And her picture was up on the screen when she got to the other side saying, this is the second time you've jaywalked. So once you get ubiquitous facial recognition and you have governments that are in control, um, the risk of a lot of data is very, very scary. So we, we don't need our privacy because we are, we think, at least for now, it's a benign government. Not that, uh, the places where we do not have privacy, and I'll get off my horse in a moment, is, are the, the Facebooks and the Googles of the world where they have our consent in the United States. And I would love the GDPR to be adopted by the United States and to have more control, uh, though I'm not convinced that it will happen. I think that, uh, um, I guess the question is, at the point at which your lack of privacy starts to do you real harm, it may be too late. I dream of a portal where, dream. I have a portal where a user really can control where their data, where they're opted in of, where they're opted out of, and where their data is going. And I really think that is on the horizon, especially with the GDPR. And I hope to be part of that initiative. So, um, one of the, I, I, as we heard, a lot of information is being collected. So one of the unintended consequences of that is, of course, that this information is being misused. So I think one thing one needs to understand is what privacy really is. And what I think becomes more and more clear, that privacy is very much about giving users control of their own information, that only those things happen with the data that they want. The Germans have a word which is called informational self-determination. So, um, informationelle Selbstbestimmung. And I think that uh, that is something that we can work towards. Although we can't foresee all the consequences of all these technologies, we should make an attempt to put users into control. And we should also make an attempt to hold those people who have those data accountable, which is again something that the GDPR does. So you, you, can, you really need to document what you're doing with the data, which data you have. If you're using them and you're saying you have consent, you should be able to prove where that consent came from. And all these different things in order to, to um, 
to at least make for regulators and users make it easy to check what you're doing. And that hopefully helps to help some of these unintended consequences in check. Can I just ask a question about the GDPR, because I'm only a little familiar with it. Uh, can I consent to give Google or Facebook my information, where I've traveled, what I've posted, what I've said? Can I, as a consumer, give them permission to do that? Yes, no? I believe you can. I just want to say that consent in the GDPR is to be specific and for specific purposes. So it can't just be a general, you know, you can do everything with my data that you want. But if it's, uh, and it needs to be appropriate for the purpose for which it is being used. So if you're getting a service related to your travels and so on, and it's only used for that service, I think that's something like that you can consent to. I would believe, I would. Okay, so I, I just, I, 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 I hate to be the, the contrarian, and I don't, this is not normally my role, though I, yeah. though I do like to be. Yeah, provided, right, Alvi. But I can imagine, uh, you know, uh, having a, you know, when I'm in Europe, my Facebook page has, you know, 20 checkboxes that I have to click to say, yes, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Uh, by the way, or if not, you are in this, these sort of the, the Facebook Balkans, where you have less functionality and less stuff to do. And I, I'm not, again, I'm a, I, I, I hosted a panel at Digital Hollywood three years ago about privacy and about control. And, and you know what happened is nobody cared. No one was interested, because at least in the United States, Nobody feels that there's used to be a big problem with privacy if somebody found out that I was gay or somebody found out that uh, I had had, you know, an STD or something. But now nobody cares. And so it is, and that's a good thing that nobody cares, but it does mean that privacy seems to be less and less important to most Americans. And if I were to channel Mark Zuckerberg, I would say, if you have nothing to hide, why do you care? It, and again, I, I'm a big fan of privacy. I'm just, I'm wary that I may not get it. Zuckerberg was by no means the first to say that. I think you're bringing up the, the much deeper issue of all the behavioral data that we have seems to indicate that um, people will trade away at a moment's notice uh, their privacy for, for a moment of convenience. And, um, and, and that if we try to address this with legal code, with legislation and GDPR, uh, if we address it on the user side, um, a whole lot of people are just going to tick all boxes uh, uh, in order to get the functionality they want from their free services. As somebody mentioned before, if we don't pay for it, uh, we get what we pay for. Uh, although, of course, we are paying for it with, with very valuable data, a point that was also made in the previous panel. How do we address um, those issues? I agree with you. I think that users... I mean, the Facebook login that you log into every single app basically with or every single website there is testimony in itself. I think that there will be a solution where you can opt into all these different places. If every time I want to go to The Economist or The Guardian or wherever else and I have to check something or sign in to get a piece of content, whether I'm clicking through Facebook to get it or wherever else, that's going to be a big inconvenience to all users. So I do believe that there is going to be some sort of universal opt-in for behavioral targeting and everything else. Um, I don't know, it's to be determined what the Facebook implement, you know, implementation is going to be for GDPR. I don't know what the Economist's implementation is going to be. There's a lot of unknowns out there, but May 25th, 2018 is looming. <laughs> I guess we're gonna be running thousands of experiments in parallel and we'll see which things work and which things don't. If I might also add, uh, I think another important issue is sort of the way that it's become normalized. Um, to the extent that when you're signing onto Facebook, you've sort of forgotten the idea that your privacy has already been taken from you. And especially um, when you're dealing with younger students, I, I also worked with a number of students specifically on issues of technology. Um, to them, signing in isn't even a recognition that they're like doing anything important. They The only relationship with Google or with Facebook isn't as a company, but as sort of uh, sort of like the utility, like turning on a light. And to that expect, um, the way to, I guess, more correctly challenge it is to sort of confront it um, through regulation. And I think that's sort of what GDPR is trying to accomplish, is to you know, explicitly draw your attention to an opt-in, to make you clarify exactly what you are giving up. Um, and while it's, I think maybe half the issue is convenience, the other half is awareness. 
So what many of us who really care about privacy care about is um, can, can a regulatory approach address this? Um, you mentioned earlier, Albie, uh, the, the problem of um, do we, do, does a large corporation divide their users and say these users are GDPR compliant and these ones aren't and, and here's our American business, there's our European business. Thomas, what happens when a user um, is using um, three different international apps in Essen and then flies to San Francisco and uses the same apps here. Um, what happens with their GDPR compliance there? I think for the purpose of a EU person traveling to the US, I think that is currently unclear exactly what's going to happen then, so we don't know that yet. The other way around, if a US person flies to Europe and your hotel bill and every other data that is going to be, be produced is going to be protected under the GDPR. So in the other direction, we know already that it's going to work. Um, so what, what was your other question? Sorry. Uh, just, um, is, is that kind of balkanization even possible, or, or is it in fact... No, I don't, uh, yeah, now I remember. No, I don't think it's, it's going to be, um, it's going to be cost effective for companies to do that. So companies will be as much as possible, align their practices, um, because it's, it's, you know, having, for example, different code bases that you need to move forward in parallel and so on is going to be very expensive. So I think people will try to accommodate the Europeans a higher standard wherever they can and only where they have very good reason will they deviate from it. And I have this experience right now myself doing a GDPR transformation for inner trust. We're trying to do this, so we're trying to apply the European principles wherever we can. And it's not always possible, it doesn't always make sense, but those should be the exceptions, not the rule. So that's the hope we all have. I'll be going. So here's what I might do if I were Facebook. I would say, if I'm a European citizen and I travel to the US, my privacy and my protection, everything would be the same as I'm used to in Europe, as I think the GDPR would define. If I'm an American citizen and I travel to Europe, then I will have a more restrictive experience. And with the hopeful result, if I'm Facebook, of saying, gee, when I'm in Europe, nothing works. They can't tell me anything. I don't know what's going on. I, you know, Facebook sucks in Europe. I, and I'm not saying that that's, again, you know, I'm sort of playing devil's advocate here, but it, 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 is, uh, it is of some concern to me that they, uh, I, when we were, um, I was working on something at one point with Microsoft, we were comparing the difference between the way we looked at Safe Harbor. And at Sony, we seemed to feel that Safe Harbor protected us. And in the same application environment, Microsoft felt that they needed separate servers in each country so that they could keep the data sequestered. It was not, it's never been really clear what you get from Safe Harbor. And so um, part of it was because of their scale, that they felt that, you know, if I'm Facebook or Google, I feel like, well, you know what? If I only have 30 million users in France, that's enough users for me to be able to use my AI to make decisions about French people and I can, I can limit that. It's not like I, I don't get enough people in my contingent to make decisions if I separate the countries out. So, and, and again, I don't know that they will do this, and I hate to think that they would. I would love the idea that, in my ideal universe, I have control over my data, I can go to anyone, and the law says, I can say, by the way, you have my data, you no longer are allowed to use it. You not only need to remove it, but you can't give it to anybody else, you can't share with anybody, I would love that be able to control my data, even at a granular level, to be Some able kind to say, of you can ability. use this, you cannot use that. I just am slightly, I'm not convinced that that's how it will work out. I think we're all hoping that GDPR forces everybody to a higher standard, but it seems like it might have the potential of um, uh, blowing back in, in the opposite direction where suddenly a bunch of companies say, well, we just won't do business in Europe, or we'll set up an American subsidiary and we'll do business from there, uh, precisely because of those issues. How, how The deeper issue here is, how do we handle people's personal, private, sometimes very sensitive data, sometimes life's at stake kind of data, um, in a way that, first and foremost, users can trust that their data won't endanger them, won't be used to harm them in some way. Um, do you want to take a shot at that, Saki, from the user perspective? One really interesting idea that I think just generally applies to the question of trust is about incentivizing trust. Um, too often we sort of talk about trust as basically a one-way street in which one person gives up voluntarily a portion of their information 
uh, in exchange for sort of an undetermined or unclear response. Um, and I think that there needs to be a sort of a, a paradigm shift toward understanding trust as a two-way street in which you deliver trust and there's a, an expectation or uh, sort of a guarantee that says that, you know, you have given me this and this will be immediately good for you. Um, and the sort of paradigm for trust as it exists now is, especially, for example, with Google or with Facebook, um, not only um, non-existent, it's almost invisible. Um, you can't even tell exactly what you're getting back or, you know, they don't, they don't have any expectation or sort of um, response, for example, when there's a data breach. Um, they just say, like, we've lost your data and there's not really much you can do about it, like, sue us. Um, and I think that if you want to have consumers willing to give up their data, there needs to be some sort of mechanism or just some sort of um, explicit understanding between the consenter and the company uh, regarding where to sort of move forward. Thank you. Where do you see things going from here? GDPR is one approach to try and capture um, the, the best possible user's outcomes and, and avoid the downside. Um, when you think about how people are going to implement, as you say, uh, um, May 18th, 28th? 25th, okay. <laughs> In there somewhere. May 25th, 2018 is looming. Um, um, From the, we looked at the startup perspective, from the large company perspective, the companies, people like your clients that have potentially quarterly revenues in the, in the you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, what they stand to risk, how do they pivot to begin to address some of these issues, especially, as you're saying, where the, the trust case is invisible or, or negative? Again, I don't think a lot of these big companies know exactly what solutions they are going to do. Unfortunately, GDPR is not like a roadmap item on a lot of these big companies. It comes up, I will tell you, most ev every one of my conversations starts in the privacy office. Um, and so I think that people are going to be looking towards third parties to help them become GDPR compliant. Um, I got into a little bit earlier, kind of the data processor, data controller, and I think that that's gonna be a real interesting thing for companies to recognize and, and, and define themselves. Do they wanna be a data controller? Do they wanna manage that opt-in? Or do they wanna just be the data processor? So I think that there's gonna be more and more um, reliance on kind of maybe third-party data controllers to take the burden off of you know all the other companies who want to just be the processor, possibly. So I would think as a big company, you have to make sure that you put the right processes in place to make the good things happen. So for example, for privacy by design, what we're talking about here is this is something that ultimately needs to be implemented by your engineers. So, but the privacy office may be thinking about it. So the privacy office should work together with your engineers in order to come up with the privacy by design guidelines and processes that you can follows so to build privacy in from the beginning into all the new technologies that you're creating to make it at least as privacy friendly as possible. And then the other thing for that is I think a big thing is education. So obviously if you, if you learn all these privacy enhancing technologies that you can use and how to use them and for which purpose, I think there's a lot to learn. So my suggestion would be for the big companies that you spend some training budget in order to train people up on all these technologies so that at least in your development teams, there are at least some people who have this understanding and who can then champion the privacy by design efforts. So one needs to make it sort of systematic and organized rather than leaving it ad hoc. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key thing that I would recommend to a big company. And you're speaking from experience, Thomas. You're in the middle of doing this right now for Intertrust. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? I'm doing it at Intertrust. Well, Intertrust is a small company, but previously I worked for HP and HP Labs, and I worked with our privacy office for like 14, 15 years on many of these projects, and we, we built something that we called an accountability tool, which was a decision support tool that we rolled out across all of HP globally, worldwide, so that any project that was done was had to go through a whole list of questionnaires and other things and being evaluated for its privacy properties. And we wanted this for accountability. We wanted to know what's going on in the company. So yeah, so it can be done, and good players will do something like this. Carla, how many large companies even know this is an issue? How many people even have it on their radar? Well, I think they do. I think definitely they do have it on their radar now, for sure. 
I just don't think that all the solutions that have been developed or by the companies. Um, yeah, I can't really talk about what Sony is. I mean, I've had conversations with Sony, but I'm not in the loop with our decisions. But um, there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the room. It just struck me that if I could come up with something as good as Google or Facebook today, but that I said that uh, if you sign up, we will share half of the revenue that you generate on advertising back with you. So if you make, if your CPM is for whatever it is, you're, you know, you have a high CPM, if you generated by your use this month, $8 worth of revenue, we'll give you four. So I know that, that, that equation, if you actually do the math, it's like a buck a year for the user. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought about it. no. It's it's. A, I think it's a brilliant idea, and I think in a perfect world, you are incentivizing people with you know their their advertising, you know, to be sold advertising. But I've recently seen a calculation, and it's like sub I, I five guess bucks it a year. <laughs> but it would be great if it. Uh, <laughs> I guess it depends on what it is, because we are in a world of microtransactions, and I can imagine, you know, the classic example is that you show me a Porsche ad, and I click on it, and I eventually buy that Porsche. Well, that particular click is worth a lot of money. And if that became a, you know, a $500 discount on my Porsche, um, so I, I but I, I believe you that you're probably right that in general, watching the beer ads, you know, that come before the, you know, before the song plays is, is, is not, not much money. But by the way, those credit cards where you get money back, that's not much money either. So it's an ongoing challenge, not yet solved. Um, does GDPR in any way constrain what new startups can do? Uh, or does it, uh, does it mean we get uh, fewer uh, um, startups that are looking for really interesting um, and, and potentially valuable uses of, of people's data in the future? Uh, people saying, oh, it's just not worth the hurdle, it's not worth the regulatory hassle. Um, in the same way that a lot of potentially very interesting uh, cryptocurrency startups were ultimately uh, dissuaded or killed by, um, by all the financial regulation? Um, or, uh, or are there other approaches and are we gonna end up with a wild west over the horizon somewhere and, and then um, a civilized Europe and a, a not, not quite so civilized US? Or how do you see this going? That's an open question for anyone. Uh, I'm a firm believer of the idea that putting limits on people just forces them to be more creative. And especially if you're forming a startup, you really already have to be creative going in, understanding the limits of you know, being a smaller company, of entering a new industry, and looking for ways to disrupt it given what you have. Uh, and I think that GDPR, um, you know, if it's done effectively, and I, I still do think it requires some reforms, but if it's done effectively, will allow these startups to reinvent a lot of the ways that we currently interact with technology, the way we understand privacy through technology, and the way we understand um, sort of securing your data um, for years in the future. So let's pivot to um, a few questions from the audience to wrap up. Anybody, and try and grab a microphone so that the rest of the I'd just like to make one comment on what you said, which is that potentially, if I were a startup in Europe, what I would try to do is based on that trust is add value to the consumer proposition so that they would want to use me as a service because of that trust for whatever it is that I'm giving them, that they had transparency and it was a, a benefit, not a, not a deficit. Going to Zaki's point about making it a very visible trust premium instead of a trust hassle, yeah. Um, can we get a microphone to the front here? Or sorry, there we go. Hey, Kevin, thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, don't believe people who say you don't have any privacy because these are the very people who sue news websites if their, their sexual orientation is declared. They buy houses all around them to protect their Wi-Fi and they cover their laptops. So don't quote those people because that's hypocritical. So to come back to users being able to decide and opt in, it's very, very hard because we don't know what the consequences of sharing that data is. 
So to give you some examples, there are companies that say, you know, our privacy policy, we will share your data with our affiliates and et cetera, et cetera, for legitimate business purpose to give you the services. And if you prohibit this use, we will not be able to give you the service. I have no idea what is legitimate business purpose, who are these affiliates, and what use they will put it to. So on the flip side, you have rules that, you know, for example, HIPAA rules, you, you prohibit use in certain ways. And that has to, again, come from a regulatory perspective, but individuals would find it very hard to make decisions when there's no transparency and there's no traceability. When I cannot know the consequences of if I share the data, what yeah. happens? Right, so I think in, in again, under the GDPR, also the secondary use of data is really restricted. You should only data, use the data for a purpose that is consistent with why they, what they were collected for in general. So you can't do something completely different with it. And also in order to give you the consent, you, the consent as that needs to be specific and informed. So they got to find a way with all the UX challenges that that brings to make, to give you that choice and to inform you, to give you the ability to make an informed choice. But if, of course it's a challenge. I completely agree with you, but it can be done better than the example that you just quoted which is essentially a blanket check. Just to be specific about her question, the kinds of things that I get in that are like, my bank says that I need to check, and they're, by their affiliate, they mean their brokerage house under the same one. Would that be allowed under the GDPR? Or would, would you know, uh, Morgan Guarantee, who's the same parent as Morgan Stanley uh, or Solomon Smith Bonnie Morgan, sort of brokerage house, is that allowable under the GDPR or not, do you know? Um, I, I don't, <laughs> and you looked at me, but, but I, I, I do think it would certainly, you had, would have at least, and this goes also back to your earlier question, you at least have to make a very conscious decision. If you're sharing it with another party, why are you doing it? Why, what is the lawful reason for you to do that? You need to be able to articulate that. And so you can't just, at least if you do it, you can't do it thoughtlessly and, and sort of, you know, accidentally. I think that should at least be prevented. And you can't do blanket statements of basically, that basically end up being, we get to use your data for whatever we want. Uh, yeah. Yes. Those go away. Yeah. This will go away. Other questions? I think we're coming to the end of a long day. Okay, a hand back there? Okay, yes. This will be the last one. I can see we're all flagging energy-wise here. Thank you. Um, GDPR seems still uh, a little bit abstract. Can uh, one of you explain in really uh, maybe short and clear form what is the data that is at risk and how can we protect it? My understanding is personally identifiable data, as we say it in the US, should be protected. But is there more than that? Can you please uh, uh, explain? It's European Commission law. I don't think you can get a one minute explanation. I don't think this is possible. but. I, I mean, just briefly, no, it is more than what you would call personally identifiable information. So I think it also includes personal data, so for example, cookies, ad IDs, and all the other information, IP addresses, they're also covered as personal data, how they call it in Europe. And the, the um, requirements from the GDPR also apply to these data, so, so, although sometimes in a somewhat weakened form if the data are pseudonymized. But so, it's, so the thing is, uh, the definition has been broadened the definition of uh, that's being covered. Does it stop tracking cookies? It, uh, no. That was the issue that Carla was addressing earlier. That's, oh, so, so the cookie is, that that's where if you start, any company that drops a cookie will then be considered a data controller and they have to have the opt-in, so. Well, you still have them, it just triggers compliance requirements on your behalf. And that becomes challenging from site to site, yes. I'll vote for that. <laughs> <laughs> I see one more question, and very energetically, so perhaps all the energy has not died yet. Uh, Kevin, uh, we've got a microphone coming your way, sir. It's, it's coming to you.
It was interesting to hear the rules about um, tracking cookies, but what if you can do the tracking without cookies, which you actually can? Sorry, let's, let's get an answer to the previous that's, question first. That's kind of fingerprinting. Are you talking about fingerprinting? A lot of companies will use different data points, fonts, operating systems, I don't know, different sort of signals, IP address to triangulate that user and guess that it's the same user, right? It's a, called statistical probabilistic fingerprinting methods, all these other things. Um, that is, you know, that's a tactic I'm not, There, those companies are going to have to have some sort of GDPR compliance mechanism just like and they also, most of those companies use cookies as part of that methodology. So they're going to still have to have some sort of compliance mechanism. Yeah, I mean, I would I'm sure it covers things like your location based on GPS, your IP address, your phone ID numbers, all of your, all the various goods associated with you. I'm sure that tracking them would be considered information that has to be protected and not uh, used cavalierly. One would hope that includes face recognition on new phones and voice recognition for your Alexa and so forth. Folks, I think we're out of time today, so we'll wrap that up. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank the panelists for their contributions. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody.